morning, y'all. Welcome to church. You can stand with us and worship. I just want to read this passage of scripture over us. Romans 8, 31 through 38. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who God condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. I love this part. The promise is, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's the promise this morning. Whatever opposition we're facing, whatever hardship, nothing can separate us from the love of God. That he's for us, he's with us, he's in us, he's all around. So I want to sing about that this morning and grab hold of that promise as we see who God is more and more. in grace and mercy you are matchless in grace and mercy there is nowhere we can hide from your love you are steadfast never failing you are faithful for creation we will sing of who you are the healer of the sick and the broken. You would comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever. For eternity we will sing of all you done. For eternity we will sing of all you've done, and we sing the God with us, the God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. God with us, and God for us. Nothing can come against. No one can stand between us. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing can come between us. Your heart, it moves with compassion. There is life, there is healing in your love. You're the Father. The Son, the Holy Spirit, for eternity we will sing of all you've done. We say, God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. between us. We remember there was death, you brought life, Lord. Where there was fear, you brought courage. And when I was afraid, 
you were with me now you lift me up you lift me up where there was death you brought life Lord thank you Jesus where there was fear you brought courage and when I was afraid you were with me yeah. now you lifted me up you lifted me up where there was death you brought life Lord where there was fear you brought courage thank you Lord when I was afraid you were with
from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Let's sing that again. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to your family. Your blood flows through my veins from my mother's womb. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again. To your family, your blood flows through my veins. So I sing, yeah, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, I'm no longer. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Of God, we your children, Father. We are your sons and your daughters. Oh, we are your children, Father. Oh, yeah, oh. Yeah, 
as I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Help us to believe. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. So I want to introduce this brand new song that was just a part of writing. And um, it's called So Much Better. I recently turned 30 a few weeks ago, which was kind of a crazy thing for me. I dreaded 30 for years and years and thought that that was the moment I was going to settle on all my dreams and just have to live an ordinary life and settle down and settle in and all these things that I just worked 30 up to be. And I started to process with the Lord, okay, God, how do you see my life at 30? And just started asking questions like, what have you brought me out of? What have we seen? And where, where are we going together? And how do you see my life? What are you calling me to? And as I looked back over the first 30 years of my life, I just kept resolving to the truth that God is so much better than I've always thought he was. Maybe in the moment, going through something hard or going through the tension or process of walking something out wasn't easy. But as I look back, I could truthfully say, God has always been so much better than I thought he was. And so I had this idea in a writing session about a month ago. Why don't we just write a song about that? I'm turning 30. You know, I want to write songs for the church out of the experience and the overflow of my life. And, uh, yeah, we just started writing this song. And two of my favorite verses have been Ephesians 3.20, where Paul's praying this prayer. And he's saying, now unto him who is able to do abundantly, exceedingly more than you could ever ask or imagine. To him be the glory. And then there's this other verse, Philippians 1, verse 6, where it says that Jesus will be faithful to complete the work that he has begun in us until he returns. And I just love that. Like, we need that reminder. I need that reminder of my life when I'm going through something, when I'm walking something out hard, or maybe when all things are well. I've just gotten a tiny glimpse of the goodness of God and his faithfulness, and he is so much more than I can see even now. And so I think there's something in our souls that can, you know, our souls can receive that in ways that our minds can't. You know, we don't always understand, we don't always know what it looks like, but I think our souls can sense it deeply through the Holy Spirit, that he is good and faithful no matter what. So all that to say, <laughs> thanks for bearing with me. I just wanna teach us this new song that very simply just says that, that he's so much better than we think he is. So I'll teach you the chorus first just so you catch it, and then we'll just, we'll flow with it. This is how the chorus goes right here. You're so much better than I think you are. The way you loved me from the very start You're so much better than I think you are My soul knows it well You're so much better than I think you are The way you loved me from the very start You're so much better than I think you are My soul knows it well Let's sing this verse together. You're the God, new beginnings. You're the God of new beginnings. You've been writing my story all along. You're the God of second chances. Grace has always kept me in your arms so much better you're so much better than i think you are the way you love me from the very start 
You're so much better than I think you are. My soul knows it well. So much better than I think you are. The way you love me from the very start. You're so much better than I think you are. My soul knows it well. My soul knows better. Sing, you're the God of new beginnings. You're the God of new beginnings. You've been writing my story all along. You're the God of second chances. Praise has always kept me in your arms you are so much better than i think you are the way you love me from the very start you're so much better than i think you are my soul knows it well so much better than i think you are the way you love me from the very start so much better than I think you are. My soul knows it well. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your faithfulness. So when we sing this, this bridge, I want us to remember what God has brought us through, what he's brought us out of what he's bringing and leading us into. If we look back on our lives, we can see the fingerprints of God, his faithfulness, his kindness, his grace. And we just simply believe that he's, if he's done it before, he'll do it again. And that'll finish the work that he started in us. We can rest in that today. So let's sing that together. seen you do it before I've seen you do it before and you'll do it again I've seen you do it before and you'll do it again my God you will I've seen you do it before and you do it again I've seen you do it before, and you'll do it again. Yes, you will. Let's sing that again. I've seen, I've seen you do it before, and you'll do it again, Jesus. Yes, you will. I've seen you do it before, and you'll do it again. You'll finish what you started. 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 I've seen you do it before. I've seen you do it before, and you do it again. We believe in God. I've seen you do it before, and you do it again. Oh, but you're faithful. I've seen you do it before, and you do it. you started you finish what you started you finish what you started you're so much better so much better you're so much better than I think you are the way you love me from the very start you're so much better than I think you are my soul knows it well so much better than I think you are. The way you love me from the very start. So much better than I think you are. My soul knows it So much better. Sing that chorus one last time again. So much better than I think you are. The way you love me from the very start. 
You're so much better than I think you are. My soul knows it. Well, you're so much better than I think you are. The way you loved me from the very start. You're so much better than I think you are. My soul knows it. Well. So, Lord, I thank you that that is true today. Would we align our hearts and our minds and our souls and our lives with that truth that you are good. Your love, your mercy endures forever over our lives, over our world. Lord, I pray that disappointment would fall off of us. Places in our lives where we haven't been able to see you, God, I pray that you would bring clarity of vision. We would open our hearts, we would open our souls to who you are, who you've always been. That you have never left us and you never will. You've always had a plan for our lives. You're always creating new beginnings because your mercies are new every morning. And your call and your gifts are irrevocable. You don't take them back. We can't lose them. So, Father, I pray, would you speak courage into the depths of who we are today? Courage and faith to walk in everything that you have planned and laid out for us, everything you've prepared the way for God, give us faith, even in the midst of questioning and doubting. Would you speak and breathe your strength into us, even today? Lord, help us to remember who you've been, and who you are today, and who you will continue to be. I pray we would sense that today, through your spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus. So good singing and worshiping with y'all this morning. If you turn to somebody around you and uh, just tell them how God has come through for you in this past season. Could be big, could be little. Ready? Greet a neighbor. Chatty today. I love it. Um, good morning, guys. I'm Elizabeth. I am so happy to be here with you all this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask if the worship hosts would come on up and prepare to receive the offering. And as they're coming up, I want to tell you guys a little bit about my week. 
um, and how God, you know, in the thick of things is moving my heart more and more towards generosity. Um, and to kind of explain that, the first thing that you need to know is I work in a largely commissioned base uh, career. And so when my husband and I think about our giving, we do a monthly tithe that just automatically comes out of our account, but then we do a biannual giving once midsummer and then once again in December. And that's kind of just based on um, what I've earned in commission. And it's obviously since I don't earn the same thing every month, it's just an easier way for us to kind of keep um, track of things and know what to plan for. So without going into too much detail, I've had a pretty tough uh, first half of my fiscal year. And uh, fortunately, I got some good news towards the end of May or early June on a couple of deals that I'd been working and um, Jason and I kind of thought about our biannual giving and we kind of knew what numbers to expect and when to expect them. So we kind of put a number on what we thought we were going to give. And we were just kind of waiting for these commission checks to come through and then we were going to give our biannual giving and we were excited about it. But fast forward, six weeks later, sparing you a bunch of uh, corporate negotiations and minutia, none of the things that we planned on have happened. In fact, this week, I found out that the two deals that I had gotten this good news on, one of them is getting moved to January, and the other one is likely not happening at all. So on Friday, after work, after a pretty rough work week, uh, God just kind of like nudged me about our biannual giving. And I was like, at a time like this, you're going to bring that up. Um, so I kind of just checked in with God, and I was like, okay, God, I mean, it would probably make more sense just to hold off and wait till things kind of turn around and come through. And I kind of was talking to him about like stewarding what we have wisely and putting, you know, a lot of thought into how we plan for our giving. And I just really felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me, you need to give it anyway. And I'm a one on the Enneagram and a firm believer in planning. And I also believe that God really honors and values financial planning um, so this like totally goes against everything like in my being and I don't often get promptings like this. Uh, but this really wasn't a question of like frivolity. It was just a question of faith. And God was like, do you trust me? And I was like, of course I do. Cause that's just what we say until push comes to shove and things actually get hard and you have to make tough decisions. And I kind of felt like God was like, you need to put your money where your mouth is. So I did. And I have no idea how it's going to pan out. Um, but I was reminded of a verse in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. It says, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And then on down a couple of verses in verse 28, it says, those who trust in their riches will fall but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Church, it's like so comfortable for us to put our trust in our riches, right? Because that provides us comfort in tangible ways. And I think sometimes when God does what he did to me this week and he calls us into something uncomfortable, it's because he wants to remind us not to lay up our trust in things that are fleeting like our riches, but to lay up our trust in him. And to be honest, comfort should never be our goal, because without struggle and without discomfort, there really is no growth. So you guys just pray with me this morning over our offering. God, thank you so much for all that you've given us. I'm just reminded, I was worshiped this morning, I was reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5.24 where it says, Faithful is he who has called you, he also will do it. Let that just rest on our hearts this morning, God, that you're never going to call us into something that you're not going to uh, see through. And would you just honor the gifts that we've given you this morning and disperse them for the uh, glory and the honor of your kingdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so while the worship hosts are receiving the offering, I have a couple announcements this morning. Uh, first off, uh, today after the service, our uh, security team and um, greeting team are going to be having lunch downstairs in room 105B. If you want to learn more about safety team, security team, or the greeting team, come on down to lunch, room 105B. There's going to be sound signs downstairs you can just follow along. Um, but please join us. Uh, next, 
Next Sunday, July 29th, Kid City is going to be hosting their first ever lemonade stand uh, to raise money for uh, school supplies for the Cone School. So come thirsty. Um, and if you have kiddos, just come um, around 930 so we can get set up and get started early. And then finally, this Thursday, July 26th, is our monthly prayer gathering. It's going to be at 7 p.m. at Sarah and Ethan Flynn's house. Um, and I actually want to invite Sarah. Sarah, are you around? Oh, hi. I want to invite Sarah to come up and share a little bit more around what to expect and her and Ethan's heart around this. Thank you, dear. Thanks. Um, so full disclosure, I prayed about a prayer announcement. Um, and I got permission from Rachel to tell a little story. So um, first, um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to communicate about prayer, I was like, okay, God, I'm going to share this epic story and then about all the things you've done, and then everyone's going to want to come pray. Like, it was pretty, pretty arrogant, right, and very adult in my thinking. Um, kind of like Nate was mentioning, just very intellectual. Like, I'm going to have proof. I'm going to have some, some proof in the pudding that prayer is more than just like a five-second statement that we say. So um, in spending some time with the Lord, um, he really humbled me a lot and was like, nope, I want you to talk about being a child in prayer. So he gave me this picture, um, and it was of, if any of you grew up in a more traditional church, or maybe you've experienced this with your own kids or nieces or nephews or whoever, like, you know, people around the table might be praying, or maybe you're in a traditional setting where people had to kneel, right? Like the legit pull out things where you sit down. Um, and the child might be kind of like looking underneath. So that was the picture he gave me of like, almost like I was the child in the picture. And I was looking up at my mom or dad, like, what are you doing? Like, why are, why are your eyes closed? So anyways, and then he led me down this thought process that really, if we're honest, um, that's what it's really still like as adults, right? So um, I'm sure all of us in our process of sanctification with the Lord, whether you came to know him when you were really little or when you were a teenager or as an adult, maybe even recently, um, God has kind of, he'll probably continue to reveal things to us along the way, right? So um, he basically was like, you need to invite everyone to just come as they are to pray. So full disclosure, we don't expect anyone to be an expert in prayer to come to prayer. Um, and in fact, he reminded me of another brief story. Um, I've met different people in my life that I call golden nuggets. Um, some of them are in this church. And um, one of whom I met when I was in college, I was probably like 20 or 21. And um, her name was Bev. I was new to the church. I had just signed on as an intern to work there. And um, I had no friends. And I was like, this is either going to go, excuse me, really well. It's really going to suck. Because I'm going to be like all spiritual, right, and get some discipleship. But I'm not going to have any friends all summer. Um, and so I saw this little tiny, it was like a five-page huge bulletin, um, like notebook size. And in the bottom right corner on the last page, there was an announcement um, to call this number if you wanted to pray. And I had met someone earlier that year that was like, if you want people who are going to go deep quick and like care for your soul, call those, call that number, meet those people. So I was like, okay, I'm going to call this number. Um, so anyway, I called the number, no answer, and left like this, this really desperate voicemail after like my third call where <laughs> I was like, hey, my name's Sarah, like real shaky voice. Um, thinking this, there's no way this person, Bev, is going to call me back. Anyway, um, I got woken up at like 6.30 in the morning the next day by Bev. And Bev turned out to be a 75-year-old woman who um, had ba battled cancer three different times. And I, I, we actually discovered that she was my neighbor. She lived a couple blocks over. Um, so the short version is I ended up riding my bike to Bev's house probably two to three times a week. And... It was because I was so curious about her prayer life. Um, she literally had a felt giant banner over her house, like in her house when you walk in, you're like, what is that? And she was like, oh, I just read about that in the Word, so I thought I'd make my own banner. 
Um, and I'm like, all right, does everybody have to have a banner? Like as a fairly new Christian. Um, and then she talked to God like she knew him. And she had designated space and time. And sometimes when we were really quiet in prayer, she would just spontaneously start singing. And I was like, Bev, what are you doing? Like I'm in the dark here. I don't know about these things. But she just didn't care. She just did her own thing. So anyway, all that to say, she tremendously impacted my life, and I've had many bevs along the way, um, many people who taught me how to listen to God's voice and how to pray um, with him in the quiet place. So um, we would love at Church of the City to create the same space that Bev created for me. We hope to create that here at church, but then also on Thursday nights. Um, and they have been phenomenal for those of you. Those of you who've been know. So all that to say, here's the deets. If you want your, to get your phone out, put in these little um, specific um, details about date, time, and place. Uh, it'll be this Thursday, July 26th. It's probably behind me. Um, from 7 to 8.30, it'll be at our house. And I think our address should be in the bulletin. Um, and just so you know what you're getting yourself into when you get there, it's kind of like Christian terms, a guided popcorn prayer. So what that means is there's, it's a guided time, right? Everybody's not talking simultaneously. Um, there'll be times where it's quiet, times where we'll listen, and then times where we actually, someone might feel led to pray a certain thing. So that's typically how it goes. Um, I wanted to leave you all with these last two verses. Um, the first one is from John 15:15, 15, 15, and it says, I no longer call you servant because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Um, and then the last one is Luke 11, 1, and it says, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. And he said to them, when you pray, say this and he taught them the Lord's prayer so um, I'm going to pray really quick after our prayer announcement um, Lord we just humbly come before you as the church as the body and we just ask that you teach us to pray um, we admit that we are like children and that as adults our hearts can be very disconnected from our spirit and so we want those to be connected and we really want to experience the mystery of prayer the sanctification that you bring through it, and just the intimacy of knowing you personally. Um, we thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Um, okay, so that was a very long announcement. So thanks for bearing with us. It's my honor to ask um, Christy McClellan to come up and share um, with us um, this morning. Christy is our pastor of discipleship at Church of the City Franklin. And if you have not had the pleasure of knowing her or sitting under her teaching yet, you're in for a huge treat. Um, this woman has dedicated her life to teaching the scriptures through a Middle Eastern lens and really applying historical context to what we see in the scriptures. So without further ado, come on up. Give her a warm welcome. Love you, lady. Thank you. Good morning. Man, it's great to be with you all today. I think it's my second time being able to be here with the Sylvan family. Uh, this is a fun month for me. As you all know, we're in the middle of a series called Summer for the Soul. And I have the opportunity to teach at all four of our campuses here this month, everywhere except for New York. And I'm loving it because what that means is I get to see kind of all of the Church of the City family in the region and to bear witness to what God is doing. Um, I had coffee with Pastor Brad, um, I believe it was last week, and he was just sharing how the kingdom of God is coming down here through Sylvan, through you all. I know August is coming, which means it's back to school, and just your care, your intentionality, your investment in the Cone School here, um, the community is hearing about it. And I hear that uh, you all are waiting for the carpet to come in, still waiting to finish everything, so we're praying for that. But I want to just say thank you uh, for having me here this morning, for allowing me to be with you and among you, this opportunity um, for God to really minister to my soul along your soul um, here in this summer series called Summer for the Soul. 
Um, as we get ready to dive in this morning, I wanted to begin with a scripture about the Word of God. I accepted Christ when I was nine years old. I grew up in rural Mississippi, and the first thing that changed about me that I wouldn't have been able to communicate as a nine-year-old, but the Spirit of God in me as a new believer, is he gave me this insane curiosity for the Bible. So I'm a nine-year-old reading the Bible, asking my pastor, where are the dinosaurs and the story, and I need to understand these things. And when you fast forward, many of you know for the past 10 years, I've been taking teams to Israel for biblical study trips. And when the Hebrews talk about reading the Bible, they don't talk about reading it. They talk about eating it. The scriptures are like food. You take it in. You let it do its work. Um, I grew up with language of having a daily quiet time in the scriptures. But a Jewish person will tell you that their daily Bible reading, they call it their parasha. And it's where we get the word portion. It's their daily portion in the scriptures that they're going to eat. They're going to take it in. They're going to trust God to do something with it. And so I wanted to begin with this quote today as we get ready for our parasha or our scripture today. It's by a man named Gregory the Great, and he once wrote this. The scriptures are like a river, broad and deep. They are shallow enough here for the lamb to go wading but deep enough there for the elephant to swim. I love that. And I think the encouragement is whatever you are, wherever you are, whoever you are, can we all just get in the river together today? Let's just get in the river of the word of God and let it take us where it wants to take us. Let it do what it wants to do. So church family, with that being said, would you stand with me? In reverence of the word of God this morning, our key parasha, our portion today that we're going to begin with is found in Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, and it reads like this. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great delight. So would you just bow your heads and let's pray. Um, Lord, here we are again, another Sunday morning. And Lord, we've said no to everything else to say yes to you and being here in this place together as your church. And so Lord, as we pull up our chairs to this biblical table, Lord, we freely and adamantly acknowledge that it is you who right now, by the power of the Spirit, will break open your word, you will break it down into bite-sized pieces, and you will feed every single one of us in this room. So, Lord, we just open ourselves to you right now. Would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us ears to hear? Would you be the lifter of our heads and the strength in our frame? Lord, would you grace us this morning to behold you through the word of God? And Lord, would it be good for our souls here in this summer series? Lord, you've been tending to us, proving yourself, showing yourself. So Lord, would your manifold love find us yet again this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as you take your seat, I want to go back to the very first verse that we began with in Psalm 19, verse 7. I think this is a really interesting verse when we really look at what it says. I'll read it for you again. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Now, when was the last time you thought of the law of the Lord as something that revives your soul? We don't typically think of law as something that revives our soul. We're ready for the love of God to revive our soul, the goodness of God to revive our soul. And yet right here, the Bible is saying that there is something about the laws of God that revive our soul. 
I mean, how many of you woke up this morning and thought, oh my gosh, it's Sunday, I can read the entire book of Leviticus today? Like, nobody woke up thinking that, because we don't tend to think of the law of God as something that actually quickens and moves and provokes our souls unto all righteousness. And yet here, very clearly in the Word of God, it says that it will do that. You know, oftentimes when we think of the laws of God, how many of you get a picture like this in your minds? We see kind of Charlton Heston coming down off the mountain and the Ten Commandments, carrying the tablets. And I don't know about you, but that's not that lovely of a picture to me. But this is what we can think of. Man, the law was given on stone. We view it as something kind of hard at times, as cold. We often think in terms of law versus grace, as if there is no grace in the law and as if there's no standard in God's grace, and yet the two come together somehow. But I want to show you another picture. I believe this is a better picture of what the laws of the Lord do in our lives. It's one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken in 10 years of taking people to Israel. It's the Sea of Galilee at sunset. And when you look at this picture, how does it make you feel? It makes me breathe. It makes me kind of be reminded that in some ancient way, all is well and all is going to be well because of who God is. And I really believe as we are living out the laws of the Lord in our soul, it is going to revive our souls. It's going to be good for us. And God is seeking to create this posture, this harmony, this flourishing in each of our lives. And lo and behold, one of the ways that he does it is through his law. So if the laws of the, if, if the, laws of the Lord, if they revive our souls, there is a command that we see over and over and over and over and over again given in the Old Testament. It has to be on God's mind because he is always talking about it. I want to teach it to you this morning. It's actually one word. It's a command that is one word that we see over and over again. It's the Hebrew word zikar. Everybody say that with me. Zikar. And it means to remember. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament, God is telling the Israelite people to remember now, I love the Hebrew language and at times how differently the Hebrew defines a word than the way we define it in our English language. And when we think of remembering something, we often think of something that's behind us. If I'm going to remember something, it's behind me. I'm looking behind me to something that's already happened. But the beautiful thing about this word zakar, biblical remembering or Hebraic remembering is actually a forward moving thing. Remembering moves us forward and the way that it works is this. Zakar carries the idea of when you're walking through life and all of a sudden something comes up in front of you and you don't know what to do. Has anybody ever been there? You ever had something come up in front of you and you don't know what to do? And rather than striving and straining, trying to figure it out, trying to solve it on your own, Zakar carries the idea when you're living life and something comes up in front of you and you don't know what to do, to stop and to remember, to think back and to recall all of the times when God so faithfully saw you through, when he got you through to the other side, and that in remembering his faithfulness, it actually informs us and quickens us to be able to move forward into that thing that we don't know what to do with. If I could take you back to the Old Testament, the beginning of the book of Exodus tells us that the Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And this is amazing to me, but listen to this. It took God one night to get the Israelite out of Egypt, but it would take him 40 years in the desert to get Egypt out of the Israelite. Their liberation came in one night. Their salvation, as we would say it, came in one night. But their maturation, their maturing happened over 40 years in the desert. And part of what God was doing with his people in the desert is he was teaching them to be a people who's a car, 
who remember. When they got into the desert, all manner of things came up in front of them that as Israelites freshly freed from 430 years of slavery, how many of you think they ran into some things and they didn't know what to do? And so God was training and he was building something into them that was so beautiful. You know, if I could briefly just take you all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. You know, we call that the fall of man, kind of when sin enters the story. And oftentimes when we talk about Genesis 3 and sin entering the story and the fall of man, we always talk about what we lost in Genesis 3. We lost our peace. We lost our innocence. We lost our relationship with God. All of a sudden, Adam and Eve have lost their peace with each other. What we never talk about is what we actually gained in the fall. Because we actually picked something up in Genesis 3. Something that Adam and Eve had not known until the moment when sin entered the story. And it's this posture of striving and straining. Adam and Eve had never strived or strained until the fall, until sin entered the story. And there's something in all of us, I don't know about you, but there's a rat that can get on the wheel for me. I have a mental rat, and he's in shape. He can run. In my mind, he wears a yellow jumpsuit with a yellow headband. He's got like a 12-pack because he can run, and he can run away with me, and I can mentally get out there. I know what it is to strive and strain. I know what it is to feel this impulse at times to act like an orphan as if I don't have a father. So when that thing comes up in front of me and I don't know what to do, rather than remembering, rather than living like I have a father who will see me through, I start striving and straining in my own wisdom and in my own strength trying to figure out the solution to that thing. Have any of you ever messed up something more trying to fix it on your own? It was bad, then you put your paws in it and it got more bad. When really God is saying, when that happens, just take some time and remember. And so I want to give a quick sketch throughout the Old Testament of that 40 years and what God was doing and creating sons out of the Israelite and taking out their slave. They cross the Red Sea in a night, but they come through as slaves. They don't know how to live as sons And one of the first things that the Israelite faced after they came through the Red Sea in the desert, they came to a place called Mara. Everybody say that with me, Mara. And Mara means bitter. And the first thing that came in front of them was they were thirsty. And the Bible says that the waters at Mara, if Mara means bitter, what do you think the waters were? Bitter. And Moses throws a piece of wood into the waters and they're miraculously made clean and the Israelites can drink. And there is a phrase that we see over and over and over again in the Old Testament, and it goes like this, remember the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Zakar the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And so they go on from Mara, and the next place they come to, it's called Elam. Now, when I had the chance to study abroad in Egypt and Israel, we actually traced the physical exodus. So we went and visited all of these biblical places and studied the Bible there. And the day that we studied at Elam, it was 127 degrees. Have you ever been so hot you just wanted to kill everybody around you? It's like, just do not touch me, I'm so hot. I mean, you get off the bus and you're just sweating It was so hard to even pay attention that day. And so they come to Elam, and now they're experiencing hunger. Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and who watered you at Mara. In other words, if I could bring you out of Egypt, if I can water you at Mara, can I not feed you at Elam? God was creating them to be sons who knew how to remember. And it's at Elam that God started providing food miraculously for the Israelite into the desert. And then they travel on and they come to a place called Rephidim. And here they're going to have their first battle, their first collision in the desert because the Amalekites were at Rephidim. Now, if I could just explain the Amalekites for you at this time in history, just think of an entire army full of dudes who look like LeBron James. They are just formidable, big, and they know how to fight. 
Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, who watered you at Mada, and who fed you at Elam. In other words, if I could bring you out of Egypt, if I could water you at Mada, and if I could feed you at Elam, can I not face the Amalekites for you? He was creating them to be a people with remembrance who know how to zakar when something comes up in front of them. The Bible says remembering is good for our souls. And it's that beautiful story of Moses, and you know it. He goes up on a mountain at Rephidim with his friends Aaron and Hur. And the Bible says as long as Moses' arms were raised, the Israelites were winning against the Amalekites. And any time Moses' arms came down, they were losing against the Amalekites. And so Aaron and Hur helped him hold his arms in the air. It's this beautiful picture of friendship and just of a communal way of living. And they defeated the Amalekites. I mean, you come to the book of Deuteronomy, and they've spent 40 years in the desert. Anybody feel like you're spending 40 years in a desert right now? You're just waiting and praying to get out of this season. Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, who watered you at Mada, who fed you at Elam, who faced the Amalekites and put them down for you. In all your years in the desert, your shoes never wore out, your clothes never wore out, you were watered and you were fed. God had shifted something in the Israelite. Now they're getting ready to go into Canaan and they no longer live like slaves, they live like sons. And God is trying to create rhythms of remembrance in us. You know, one of the most beautiful things about the desert for me is the way that the Israelites spent their Sabbath, their Shabbat. They would cease their work and they would all get together and they would light their Sabbath fires or their Shabbat fires. And if you're ceasing your work, what do you do all day on a Sunday? They would get together and they would tell their God stories. They would tell their God stories. They would remind each other of God's faithful record and history in their lives. There's something about remembering that is good for our souls. When was the last time you took some time to recall, to remember, to remind yourself of what God has already done in your life, even leading up to this moment? I want to show you two passages of scripture that actually say that remembering is good for our souls. We're in the middle of this summer for the soul series. In Psalm 42, verses 5 and 6, it says this, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. So the Bible is saying that when our souls are downcast, and some of you may be here today and you would say that your soul in this season is downcast, the Bible is saying, Zakar, remember, look back at what God has already done In your lives. One more in Psalm 103. I wish I had time to read this entire psalm to you. It's amazing. Maybe you could eat it later today after you get home. But Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5 says this Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all of your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, if you are not forgetting, what are you doing? Remembering. And the Bible says if you want your youth to be renewed like the eagles, that the way to do it is to remember. You know, there's something really interesting about us as human beings. It doesn't matter where you are, how old you are, what language you speak, but somehow we tend to be a forgetful people. We can easily forget what God is doing. I want to show you one of my favorite quotes. It's by a man named Charles Spurgeon, and he once wrote this. We are too prone to engrave our trials in marble and write our blessings in the sand. We are too prone to engrave our trials in marble and write our blessings in the sand. 
You know, I don't know about you, but my pain is always with me. If you ask me, Christy, what's broken you in half in this life, I can readily tell you. But I have already forgotten some things that God did in my life three months ago. I don't know how it is we remember our pain, but at times we forget the things that God has done. I don't know about you, but I'm asking God to cultivate rhythms of remembering in me. I want to be a person who can zakar. I want to live like a son and not like an orphan. I want to be able to remember. You know, every January I start a new journal. And I write in it over the course of the entire year. And every December, I take three days and I go back and I read my journal for that year. And I'm always amazed at the things that God has done just in that year that I've already forgotten. Like, I clearly need to be postured in remembering. And this became very real for me. Probably about two years ago, as many of you know, I'd served on staff at a church for 17 years Life was clicking along. I have such a passion to teach Bible and take people to Israel and Turkey and Greece and Italy. I'm a visual learner. I want to study the Bible where it happened. And I felt like God was coming to me and saying, Christy, it's time for you to take that leap. It's time for you to take that jump. I want to align you to better do what I've called you to do. Now, at that time in my life, all of my other transitions had been directional like lily pads. Okay, I'm leaving here, but I'm jumping here. I always knew where I was going. I knew what was next. This was the first time God kept coming to me and saying, Christy, it's time to take the leap. And I kept going, great, where are we going? Silence. Has God ever, like, told you what to do and then didn't seem to tell you how to do it? I'm like, God, I need you to finish out the rest of this story. I'll take the leap, but where are we going? And it was silence. And over several months, it became clear to me that God was actually asking me for the first time in my life to leap to nothing. To leap first, and it would all get figured out later. Now, for some of you who are more adventurous, that might sound like fun to you. But for me and my story, I'm Captain Safety. And I need to know the next things. I'm a planner. I'm a two on the Enneagram list, but I'm a planner. And the idea of jumping into nothing, I'm single. How many of you know Franklin ain't cheap? Like you're asking me just to walk away from everything I know to leave a job without having a job. And y'all, it was like a terror for me. I had never had a panic attack in my life until that season. I was struggling. And man, God gave me the grace to actually take the leap, which I'm a little bit amazed at. If you need to know what God can do, he can make Captain Safety take a leap into nothing. And so I took that leap by faith, and I'm probably 30 days into it, 30 days after resigning from this church where I'd been for 17 years, and all of a sudden, my car developed a gas leak, and it was going to cost more to fix it than the value of the car. And I'm like, God, wait a minute. I don't get this. I did my part. You're supposed to do your part. Everything's supposed to start coming together and it seemed like it was moving in exactly the opposite direction of that. And probably six weeks after my car, I'm sitting on my front porch drinking coffee one morning. It's a sunny, beautiful, warm day. And I look over to the right and I notice there's water coming out from underneath my garage door. And I think, that's not normal. And that's not good. And I open up my garage and my hot water heater had busted. Anybody know how expensive a hot water heater is? I was kind of like, man, I'm just going to boil my water on the stove. I'm not getting a new hot water heater. These things are expensive. I'm literally 60 to 90 days into this adventure, into this thing that felt like nothingness, and I have to get a car, and I have to get a hot water heater. And, man, one morning I was walking my dog, Chester. We, go, we walk every morning. And I don't know if you've ever just lost it on God, but I was losing it on God. I was like, God, I can't believe this. You're the one that made me jump. Now you're not taking care of me. I was just letting him have it. And clear as a bell in that moment, I can probably count on one hand the times in my life when God has spoken in such a clear way. And I think he was clear because he knew I was going down. Like, Christy's going down. I better catch her because she's about to lose it. And I heard God say to me, when have I ever failed you that you would doubt me like this? When have I ever failed you that you would doubt me like this? 
And man, the interesting thing about God is when he asks you a question, you have to answer. And what that question started in me was this process of remembering. I remember I went back to my house that day and I took out a sheet of paper and I started remembering, well, let's see, has there ever been a time when you failed me? And I started thinking back over my life and I wish I could tell you in that moment that angels came down from heaven, you know, led by Gabriel, greetings, you who are highly favored, something like that, with a new car and a hot water heater, you know, that'd make the story even better. But that didn't happen. But as God started cultivating me into a creature of remembrance, as somebody, when something comes up in front of me, I don't strive and strain like an orphan. I act like a son. I'm able to stop. I'm able to simmer. I'm able to look back, remember God's faithfulness in my story. It did indeed move me forward. And that happened almost two years ago. I'm just past that two-year mark. Standing here with you all today, I had no idea of all that God was going to do in my life. But what are your rhythms of remembering? How are you going to remember what God has done in your life so that you can take heart to move in to some of the things that God has for you? As we get ready to close, I want to show you a few more passages. I love this passage in Hebrews 12. I tell my students at the college, I've been teaching Bible at Williamson College for the last 13 years, and I'm always telling these 18 to 22-year-olds to stare at Jesus and to glance at their lives. We have such a tendency to stare at our lives and to glance at God from time to time. And yet in Hebrews 12, it says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I love this passage and there's something about it that's both individual and communal. I have this opportunity as an individual in my own relationship with God to remember. But I really think as the people of God, we need to come together and communally remember and to set our eyes to fix our gaze on Jesus together. And that somehow, just like the Israelites in the desert, it's going to be good for our souls. I don't know if you've ever seen this African proverb. I have it written at my house, but it simply says this. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. There's something about that that's very true. And so as we come to a close today, I have a question for you. We see God in the Old Testament over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, commanding the Israelites to remember, to zakar. We are the New Testament church living in the New Testament age. Do we find this command to remember in the New Testament? Is there anything in the Bible where God is encouraging us in our generations and in our day to be a people of remembrance? And the answer is yes. And it actually comes to us in one of the most famous passages that we have as a Christian people. We do it every single Sunday as a church of the city family. And it's found at the Last Supper. It's what we call communion. And I want to show you Jesus' words in Luke 22. It's the Last Supper that he's sharing with his disciples before his arrest crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. And in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, Jesus said this, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's the same word. It's the same word picture. Jesus is saying, every time you come together, 
every time you eat and drink, every time you experience this thing that we call communion, it's an opportunity for us to communally as the family of God, Zakar, together, to remember our God stories, to look back and to remember Jesus's faithfulness in our lives. Now, we all know the word of God is given to us not to make us smarter, but to actually change our lives. And so this morning, we want to practice this. We want to communally zakar together during communion. So I want to invite the worship host to come up. And as they pass out the elements, you're going to stay seated today. And I want to invite you to hold your elements. We're going to all take communion together here in a few minutes. I'd like to invite Nate and the worship band to come back out. But we're going to just take a few moments before we all leave and head to lunch and go on with our day. We want to remember together this morning. So Nate and them are going to play for us. Thank you. And I just want to open up this space for you just in your own heart, in your own soul, in your own mind right now to spend some time remembering. Nate talked about that that song he wrote, it came out of him remembering God's faithfulness in his life his first 30 years. So we're just going to enter into a time of quiet as they play. This is your time to remember before the Lord. Hold your elements. And in a few moments, we'll take communion together. We'll sing a song together and we'll be done. But take some time to Zakar this morning. And on that night, the Bible says that Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. When you eat this, eat it in Zakar of me. Let's remember Jesus together in eating. And on that same night, the Bible says that Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you the blood of the new covenant. When you drink this, drink it in Zakhar. 
Let's remember Jesus together. The Bible goes on to say that they sang a song before they departed. So appreciated Nate's song, freshly written. Today's the first time I've ever heard it. I thought it would be perfect for us to go out singing. So would you stand with me? So we sing this song together one more time. I'll briefly come up afterwards to give a brief benediction. But as we sing this morning, let's do it in a spirit of remembering God's faithfulness in our lives thus far. And this utter knowing that he's going to see us through to the other side. lunch together today get in touch with the people sitting around you go share a meal and remember together tell your God stories to each other 
times when God provided, times when he answered prayer, times when he gave you wisdom when you didn't know what to do next, times when he touched your body. Whatever those stories are, they are meant to be shared, to ring out in the earth. Because in the end, here it is, the Lord has never failed a people yet. We will not be the first. The Lord has never failed a person yet. You will not be the first. Let's be a people who remember. The Bible says it is good for our souls. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord, your faithfulness is astounding. So sure, so certain. Lord, we can throw our whole weight on you. You can handle us. And so, Lord, I pray as a kingdom community, we would remember this week, both individually and communally, both on our own and collectively. So at our lunch tables today, Lord, at our dinner tables tonight, Lord, help us this week to set a table, invite people to it, and to tell our God stories. Lord, you've never failed the people yet. We will not be the first. Teach us to be sons who remember. Lord, it's good for our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday, Sylvan. God bless.